Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to episode 29 of the ESG show. Today we're talking about putting the S back in ESG or, or, or another way of looking at the S in ESG. So let me tell you a little story to set the scene. So the other day, I forgot my iPhone. I was in a rush, a lot was going on, and then this terrible thing happened. I put the device down for a second, someone shouted at me to hurry up, and you know, and I went out. And first of all, I was unaware, but kind of I was aware of a kind of dull emptiness, like something was missing. Strange, I thought, after pondering the feeling. Let me Google what it means. Then this is when the terrible truth dawned. It was like I was naked. I'd gone out without one of my arms. If you've ever read the book or watched the film Lord of the Rings, you'll know what I mean when I call my phone my precious. People talk about the fourth industrial revolution, AI, internet of things, big data. But to me, the smartphone is, is bigger than that. I believe it's just changing us. It's changing us for better or ill. Now, our species is called Homo sapiens sapiens, which literally means wise, wise man to distinguish us from other forms of human now extinct, extinct, such as Homo sapiens neanderthals. But I wonder sometimes if that is no longer us. We have either become Homo sapiens augere, which means augmented wise man, or maybe we can remove the, the wise bit altogether. We're no longer wise humans, we're simply uh, homo technologica, technology man. But this is just the beginning. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the new Vision Pro launched by Apple. Um, I'm going to run the advert for a few seconds. I'm not going to run the, the whole advert, and I hope I'm running this right live from YouTube, so let's hope there's no mess ups occur. But um, um, You're nothing but a dreamer. Well, can you put your hands in your head? Oh, no. I said, dreamer. I said, why? If you want to think, then you the like me this. Okay, I think we've seen enough of that advert. I hope you've, you've seen enough. But I don't know, I just find that something potentially slight dystopian about uh, augmented re reality. I have this dy dy dystopian view of a new near future in which we always have an augmented reality device with us, maybe in the form of contact lenses accompanied by an AI assistant. Maybe the AI assistant will be like Jiminy Cricket, the talking cricket who acted as Pinocchio's conscience in the Disney adaptation of Carlo Collodi's book, The Adventures of Pinocchio. Um, now, that advert for, um, for the Vision Pro, I did play that for, for a reason, which is the song, the music to that um, advert was a song called Dreamer by a band called Supertramp, which happened to be one of my favorite groups when I was a kid. And I say that because Supertramp, uh, on the same album, in fact, from that track, there was another track, and it happens to contain my favorite quote from all of rock music, and maybe it's my favorite quote from anywhere, actually. And it says, but who are these men of lust, greed, and glory? Let's rip off their masks and let's see. Oh, no. That's not right. What's the story? For there's you and there's me. So today we are discussing inner learning and taking a peek at something that Joanna Macy calls active hope in her book of the same name. Yes, the world is a dark place right now. I have two young children and I'm, well, I am, I have two grandchildren, I beg your pardon, uh, and I'm truly vexed by what the future has in store. But there is reason for hope. Um, but that hope, I believe, relies on us. And I think it partly lies with ESG. Today, we have three guests, three great guests, whom I'll introduce you to very, very shortly. And they will explain why there is hope, what we can do about it, and why all this relates 
to ESG. So let's meet the guests. And today on the show, we have Ray Edgar. Hello, Ray. How are you today? You just need to press the uh, unmute, the, the, the mute button, Ray. Uh -huh. right. Thank you. Hello. Um, can you hear me? I can, we can hear you loud and clear. Super. Um, well, thank you um, for um, the discussions we've had and, and inviting me on the show, uh, Michael. Um, and also, thank you to all the guests who've, who've tuned in. I did a rough calculation before the show based on connections and followers. If everybody um, is, is in who accepted, we are approaching half a million potential <laughs> second um, connections, which is quite astounding. And that's only the people watching now. Okay, well, that's all right then. So, so, uh, so Ray's been working with me on this show to help me put together. So thank you for your help, Ray. Um, mm -hmm. Ray is a successful entrepreneur, coach, and organizational change catalyst. Uh, and he's been doing that for over two decades. He has now taken on a new challenge, asking new questions and facing the task of future forming in a post-COVID world. At its heart, this means exploring how we can share meaning and start to generate renewed belief in our shared possibilities to co-create a better world. His focus area is helping organizations to facilitate and bring people together to create adaptive spaces, a shared learning spaces. These developmental learning practices act as scaffolds for internet, for internal, I beg your pardon, for internal growth. Personal transformation and shared insights can be literally life-changing, enabling people to reconnect and move into new emerging possibilities. Ray says, the outcomes I'm pursuing are huge uh, for our future. How can we, in the midst of a potentially existential crisis, look inwardly, share this with other people and, and find something new? Can we change the systems that are driving us and move to more regenerative, sustainable innovation? So, Ray, that's, uh, you've taken on a new challenge. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Oh, you're on, you're on mute again, Ray. Like many people um, during COVID, I kind of lost my way maybe 18 months ago. I, I lost purpose in what I was doing. It didn't seem to make any sense anymore. And moreover, after 15 years working in large organizations with transformation programs and sports programs, it was diminishing returns. I don't say, the, say that these programs don't achieve something, but um, maybe not quite what they set out to achieve. Um, and we'll find out a little bit more today around that and what we might do differently. Um, and so I took some time out and I decided to do some training, some learning, pursue some growth. Uh, actually, I ended up moving towards really understanding the stories that were running me and 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 really understanding something different about what was possible along the way. One fascinating story I'd like to tell you in the sustainability space is that in my research into this area, and we all know it's complex, it's very, very complex, but in my research in this area, I came to understand that um, what people are seeing is that because of all of the of of the stress and the complexity we're facing um, in the current world as it is, it seems that um, we're all now holding fragments of possibilities. So that is, everything is so complex, we only hold a fragment of reality, but in order to survive in this world, we build this up into a whole world. And in fact, that's the sort of world that we all live in. I think, you know, Mark Twain said, it's, it's not, it's not, um, not what you don't know that gets you, it's what you think you know that really isn't so. And so with this research, what people found was if if you can get people together to share those facts and actually create a different reality, then suddenly those complex changes start to look like new possibilities. And so that's the work really around adaptive spaces, creating deliberately developmental structures for people to come together 
and actually share their realities and realize that these are filters they've kind of created from those fragments. So that's my new challenge, really, to, to, to bring that and help organizations do that and purpose and innovation. Okay, thank you for that, Ray. Um, we're also on the show today. We've got Art, Art van der Horst. Hello, Art. How are you today? Hey, good afternoon. We are good. Yeah, sun's finally came out here after weeks. Good. And where, where, where are you right now? At the moment in Zwolle in the Netherlands, the central, central Netherlands. Okay. Okay. So Arts is the co-founder of 360 Degree Horizons. He's an entrepreneur, facilitator, coach, certified team coach, and a development program designer. In his younger years, not knowing what to expect from life, he found himself on the top of a Romanian mountain range amidst a group of local kits and being part of an exper experiential, an experimental program supporting and installing social capital called Vieta, meaning of life. These weeks changed his life until today, realizing two things. Positive social change is possible and groups can transform into hubs of meaning which make all members thrive. And when there is change for good, when and where this change for good happens, he wants to witness that and contribute uh, and contribute. This experience amongst the mountains and forests threatened by illegal logging led him to study and practice both education as religion and actively work with teams and groups old and young across the world being a certified and experienced team coach senior trainer educator and coach others called art highly skilled in observing analyzing creating facilitating learning processes and positive change from within uh, and these last few years the coalition gathered within 360 degrees of Horizons. He supports corporations mainly through aiding their CSOs in their mission to learning and development, leadership and strategy in such a way it supports positive change from within. Um, 360 Degrees Horizons runs international change and leadership programs, workshops and change journeys. The Inner Development Goals is a useful framework. Um, well, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask Art about inner development goals in a second. So, Art, um, you say when and where this change for good happens, I want to witness that and contribute my part. How's that going for you? <laughs> yeah, that's a good, good question. It's great, great actually to hear that back, like your own life story in a sense. Um, and I think to me, it depends a bit on the glasses that I wear. <laughs> daily where i witnessed that and um uh i think last time a few weeks back i saw, definitely saw it in a participant in one of the programs that we we're part of um you could just see the change happen in the moment like like in the netherlands with this this saying like the quarter drops like something internally changes and, you, and it changes the outcome of how someone looks and how someone behaves and um, right after it um but I think I also realized those are very rare and special occasions in a sense. These are magical moments and they don't come like every day <laughs> um, to be witness of that. And um, we're just starting up our business and doing the grind of that. So that's also my daily reality, um, trying to create the, let's call it the, uh, the environment in which I could see and witness that change within people uh, as much as I can. But um, yeah. So for today, it's more like the glasses that I wear and just witness the small, small the small things, small progress. Otherwise, I will get lost. <laughs> All right. Okay. And can you tell me a little bit about inner development goals? Yeah, that's something, an initiative or call it a movement or call it the organization of the inner development goals that were founded in close relation to the sustainable development goals, well known within corporations and I think with the public audience around the world. Um, back by the UN, um, but they focus mostly on the inner and the essential inner skills, like the human traits, human competences that are needed to actually achieve results towards those sustainable development goals. So that was how they were born, <laughs> what made them come alive. And um, uh, yeah, they somehow show me that there is 
like a key. Like if you want to see some good change on the outer side, you have to work on the inside as well, collectively. I would say that would be the, the short introduction of the inner development goals. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Also on the show today, we have Michael Hammond. Hello, Michael. How are you today? Hello, I'm doing very, very well in this cold, late winter day in Stockholm, Sweden. Oh, the sun... you're in Stockholm, are you? Must be, must be. I would imagine it's cold at this time of the year there. Yeah, <laughs> it's beautiful though. Okay, so Michael is an enterprise coach, right? Writer. His book. You're going to have to help me with the pronunciation of this, Michael. Evolved agility. Have I said that correctly? E e evolved agility. Evolve oh, evolve agility. Got you. Okay. Uh, growing an adult leadership culture from the inside out. It provides a blueprint for what it means to be an agile leader in today's complex world and offers practical roadmap for getting there. For the past 20 years, Michael Hammond has guided organizations and organizational leaders towards greater holistic team and enterprise level agility, primarily by helping them to grow their inner capacity for leadership agility in the face of complexity, volatility, and the ambiguity of the 21st century life and business. Recognized as a highly effective workshop leader, Michael creates deep learning environments in which participants have, fe have leave feeling inspired by the insights and inner, sh and inner shifts they experience. So Michael, could you just tell us a little bit about Evolve uh, Agility, please? Um, so, Basically, I have for many, many years been a stand for the possibility of human transformation. And uh, I got into the world of agility many, many years ago. And uh, the book Evolve Agility was written as a kind of reflection on what I'd been doing as a consultant for many years, which is ultimately helping people and organizations grow the outer structures and systems and processes they need by growing the inner meaning making capacity. And um, so I have been a long, stu long time student of adult development, of transformative learning, um, also of design. I was a composer for a long time. And um, so all of this really has come together to inform uh, the book of, uh, of Evolve Agility. Okay, thank you for that. Well, if we have more time, I'll ask you to tell us about your, your com composition, but um, alas, I don't think we're going to have enough time, I'm afraid. Um, you also like to quote Daniel Schmuttenberger, I don't know Schmuttenberger. I mm -hmm. Schmuttenberger, who said, if we don't have the capacity for outside influence over the current systems, the current systems will be what dominates us um so what does that mean and why do you think it's important well by current systems he's referring to the systems in which we are embedded in fact we are so embedded in these systems that we're unaware that we're embedded it's the kind of metaphysical environment we find ourselves that gets expressed in culture it gets expressed in terms of what's hard what's impossible what's easy what's not what's pleasurable what isn't and we swim in that culture. It's literally the water in which we swim. And what he's talking about when he, when he uses the term capability, outsized capacity, is the ability to stand back from all of that, to be able to look at it and to choicefully engage in the creation of alternatives, both inner necessarily and outer. So that's how, that's how I read that. Uh, for me, it's a profound and prophetic uh, statement. Okay, thank you for that. I think maybe a bit later on in the show we can expand on that a wee bit, but thank you for that. Now uh, we're going to be rejoined by uh, uh, by by the rest of the, the team for today. And guys, before we get um, um, started, we've had a question from uh, Dawn Rennick, who's actually been a guest on, on the ESG show in the past. She says, these inner development goals should be part of curriculum in schools to help our future children develop critical skills and to lead sustainability comments on that yeah it made me smile right away and i think it's a very great comment because i see it happening already some universities uh, colleges are adapting they're really ahead of us all ahead of the corporate world ahead of many other worlds they're just doing it 
making it part of the curriculum, like how are we being human amidst all of this and how to be a human for good. So there's amazing work going on in that area. So it's, it's spot on. And uh, I think it's very hopeful that practitioners in the educational field are just absorbing this and making it their own. Their own so. Okay, thank you for that. Has anyone got anything to add to that comment? I would only add that um, there are, in fact, some countries, Michael, who have taken these on and are actively engaged in getting organisations and institutions to the level where people would re be, be reporting against these and, and how they're actually achieving them. I think Chile is one, certainly some South American countries, but, but we'll hear later about how, how this relates to sustainability in the SDGs. Okay. All right, thank you for that. So now we're going to be having a look at some recent media um, coverage. And um, um, the, uh, Art, you spotted a piece about a paint attack uh, uh, leads to a president comment. Um, a paint attack leading to a presidential comment. Uh, so can you paint a picture telling us what this is all about? This is amazing. And, and yeah, you should see the picture, but you have to find the little video still that uh, the video that's out there. So it, it just happened a few days ago. So you'll be able to find it, I think. But what's so amazing, if you watch that video, I mean, we see this happening over the time, like protests happening, like people scream out to be heard, like, please take care of the environment, please do more, stop oil, all the, all the other things we do as humans to let our voice be heard when we feel we're not heard. Um, but he's in a, in a position of leadership, let's put it that's, this way, um, and then he receives this green paint attack over him, so he's flushed in green paint, and the way he reacts is just, gave me hope, it made me smile and gave me a lot of hope, because the calmness, the way he kept himself together, and then he said, the reason, something like, is Portuguese, I don't speak Portuguese, but something like, the reason why I get this paint is a good reason. <laughs> And let's start, you know, doing the work and doing the debate and do it the way uh, why I'm here. Um, so without any uh, condemnation of the attacker, we can condemn the form, but he didn't condemn the message behind it and the reason behind it. And it just struck me, it's like the inner work, just imagine what his upbringing must have been to be attacked and then react with this composure. It just made me wonder, like, will I do that? Will I? Because I can see the screens and the protests everywhere. Uh, maybe should be even, even more. But can I react with this inner calmness and step fast? Like, I'm in this position. This is what I need to do. And you are right. Uh, I will not condemn you for it. But let's move forward. Let's do this. Together. So, okay, that's very yeah. interesting. It reminds me, actually, I don't know how long ago this was, 15 or so years ago, that the, uh, the deputy prime minister in the UK, someone um, threw egg in his face. And he was in a crowd, you know, and there was even someone threw an egg in his face and he turned around and, and hit him. So quite a different reaction from the Portuguese president there, I think. <laughs> anyway, um, Ray, you also spotted a piece about burnout, I believe. Um, burnout is the greatest risk. This is in Strategic Risk magazine. Uh, burnout is the greatest risk facing organizations in 2024. How do you tackle it? Yeah, indeed. Um, the reason why this is important to me is because, and most of the viewers won't know, but um, we, we didn't have time to talk about why what I was saying relates to the SNASG. But I'm really on here with a call to action to, to, to human potential. And for me, that's the huge thing about social and ESG, that's human potential. And there's, there's a sort of dissonance at the moment because I make up that since COVID is over, that everybody's getting along okay. Okay, there's a bit of an economic issue going on. And we, we saw that last year. But apart from that, we let's just get try and back, get back to normal and knuckle down, etc. But the reality in the workplace is completely different. The levels of, of burnout are higher than, than we've ever known, and they continue to rise. The levels of stress, the disengagement on the floor. And um, this story is just pointing to the fact that people who assess risk in organisations, they see those numbers and the reality. 
and I want to bring people back to discussing that, actually growing beyond it by accepting it, but then actually finding ways to, to, to really get people back to purpose. And, and, and um, my belief, just to finish on that, is that a lot of the disengagement and the stress is because people aren't attached to purpose. They, they, they don't have agency within their organizations. And so what do they do? They, 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 they're kind of a bit lost. And, um, and I think we, we can actually face up to this together. Okay, thank you. That's interesting. Mm. Okay, mm. well, I suppose related to that, um, Michael, you spotted a piece in, um, um, let's see the name of the publication. Oh, it was on the BBC, BBC Work Life. Um, executive hubris is driving five day in the office mandates. And the article is basically saying that some high profile, high profile CEOs are demanding for return to work with a command and control mindset. But the article says they're doing this to reassert control over employees and blame employees as a scapegoat for bad firm performance. Um, so please, Michael, tell us more about this. Well, for me, it's th this article is emblematic of the dying gasp of uh, basically a dinosaur breed and um, the wave, the coming wave simply much larger than anything that the residual command and control sentiment that still exists can, can exert. And we have actually moved far beyond that. And um, that kind of behavior is permissive only within a very old world sort of uh, mindset, an old meta, you know, metaphysical way of looking at the world. And so for me, it just struck me as the, the last gasp, like, like the duck bill platypus, which I understand is an animal uh, that has been around for a long time, but its, but its ability to adapt and evolve is completely shut down. And so it'll do its thing, just like these companies and these leaders will, but they will become increasingly irrelevant. Okay, thank you for that. And Ray, you've, we've had a, a guest agreeing with you. Stress is a result, this is from Ellen Williams, stress is a result of being disconnected from purpose. Um, so, and she thought that was a good observation, Ray. So, uh, and, uh, and another comment from, uh, from Dawn. Yes, uh, dying obsolete breed of executives and management approach, um, which is actually a theme that I discussed with um, Dawn when she was on, on the show previously, actually. So thank you for that, Michael. Um, I'm going to have a very brief chat with Ray, and then uh, that is going to be followed when Ray has a chat with Art. And um, so Ray, let's just uh, remind people who Ray is. <laughs> um, so Ray, you're a very fan of a, of, a, of a book, I believe, called Active Hope. Um, um, can you tell us a little bit about that and how that yeah. ties in with what you're what you're talking about? So, Active Hope is a book by. Um, you're going to have to remind me. I can't. Read Joanna Macy. Joanna Macy. I and think Chris it's also written by Chris Johnson. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that's the same Chris Johnson that wrote Emergence. I've no idea. But anyway, um, yes, please enlighten us. <laughs> okay. So. I've had many, many, many conversations with people over the last 18 months trying to really sense make and make meaning of what's happening out there. And, and what I come across quite often in these conversations is what's been described as um, the value action gap. So what, quite often the question is, but what can I do in all this? And um, I was considering this question when I was in a, in a class um, a course with Dr. Dan Siegel. And he advised, have you considered reading Active Hope and, and seeing what's in there? So I did. And what I learned from that is, I, I'm, and I mentioned earlier the stories that run us, that 
as a model, we kind of all run by three stories simultaneously at the moment. And the one that gets us is the business as usual, the things that just have to be done today and this sort of, well, what can I do? But if you scratch the surface just below that, um, um, there's, there's another story. And that's and that's how everything's disentangling. Everything's fragmenting. You know, the, the stuff we don't we know the world's unraveling, but we can't do anything about it. And then there's a third story. And that third story is the great turning. So slowly but surely, we get to be aware of other things that are happening, but we don't know how to get into them. So this values to action gap exists. And Joanna talks about how we live in those stories and how we move into active hope. And so what active hope means is not just hoping that tomorrow will be better, but coming into action and have an intention through having awareness of those stories that are running us. So if you put up the graphic, I just want to make a point here. What she says in the book, she talks about this model you can see on screen. And what we're doing generally and what we talk about are the first two holding actions. Um, you know, uh, for example, limits on 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 output, limits on 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 carbon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, carbon offsetting. Then we're putting in new systems in place, so ESG reporting, etc. But the reality is um, that we can do both of these things, but the macro effect in our system is actually very small. Because what it's going to take is also a shift in our consciousness to enact the results of that and change the system. This is what Michael was talking about, about that level of complexity and being able to see the system we're in and make choices. And that's going to take an internal shift in our consciousness. And that's why I'm really interested in what Joanna's got to say. OK, thank you for that, Ray. That was very interesting. Now, Ray and Art are going to have a chat expanding on some of these ideas. So I'm going to hand over for five minutes or so and uh, I'll leave you in the capable hands of Ray and Art. Hi, Art. So it's a perfect segue into consciousness and, and change. Um, you, how are you doing? You OK? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Those three stories, the way you describe it, struck me again. It's like, I think that's that's what it is, uh, to meet people where they are on that storyline and to help each other to dive a bit and, and to play around with the three. And I call, I call I deliberately call it play around but because it can be really heavy as well. But that's why I like to say play around with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. For that. Wonderful. Can you take us along a bit and, and just tell us about in development goals and how they came about? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and, and just to say right off the bat, those who are interested and are listening, the, the website of the innerdevelopmentgoals.org, I think it's the easiest way to just to get all the info you want around where they stand right, right now. So but the original, let's say the originating story of that was, of course, we all know those sustainable development goals um, widely known, colorful blocks, uh, broadly adopted uh, as a framework, as guiding principles to work on, something to fix. You know, it helps our brain to say, yeah, let's focus on uh, education worldwide. Yeah, let's make that better and as accessible for all. And then, and also save marine life. Yes. And, and you can somehow pick <laughs> what you want to work on in a sense. Uh, and that's what we do. And, and somehow it's wonderful. It helps us to make choices. Mm -hmm. And um, if you peel it down, uh, there's also not the progress, I would say, that we would like to see, all of us. We can see the unraveling taking place, as you described it. Um, I think that's why what the inner development goals bring into the mix, like what's happening inside of us as human beings, as human species, of which we see the results in the outside world. Uh, so we're related to that, and it's it's. I rather call it not inner development goals because, you know, well that's a whole different path to take. Like, are they goals or? Um, but it's a helpful way. Like, see it as a goal. They're just they're divided in five easy to grasp categories, and there's 23 
let's say human traits, human competences behind them. Please check out the website if you want to know more about those. But into being, thinking, relating, collaborating, and acting, which right away when you see that, you're like, aha, that makes sense. You know, it it, it all makes sense in a way. Like this, this is a complete part of what it means to be human. Um, and then from that, of course, the question is, what does that mean? Where do I stand? Um, so the way we like to use and frame the inner development goals, like see it as an invitation, an invitation to explore the three stories, maybe, <laughs> linking to you, Ray, to uh, explore where are you, where are you with your team, where are you with your organization, and what to not work on and what to fix, but what are the enablers that will help you to be more, let's say, successful in, in, in relation to the sustainable development goals. And this, and it's amazing what people come up right after, if you just ask this, as you see it as an invitation. Um, okay. What, to... what would you say is the, is the current state of, of, of inner development goals within organizations which have adopted them um, as a vehicle to support their transition? Yeah. Um, Current state, well, what I saw right away happening is there's a huge widespread uh, adaptation of, uh, let's say, entrepreneurs, practitioners, schools, uh, also organizations, corporations who just took it and ran with it. Like, let's do this. Let's just use it as a framework of our thoughts and of our being. And um, you can read in the, like, say, in, in white papers and publications. Um, and what I see is a grassroots movement. So there's about 400 plus international hubs in various ways and sizes and shapes, which is wonderful to see. And I think you can, you can distinguish three main elements. There's a strong academic push for the inner development goals and academic uh, adaptation as well, application. The private sector is working with it. So a few companies are leading the way. Like, what does that mean for our HR, L&D, uh, the way we do leadership transformations, you know, just adapt it. And there's the public sector as well. Some of them already mentioned, like governments and local governments are adapting to it, are using it as a mirror, as a framework to watch, like, where do we stand? How do we cooperate? How do we create something together uh, in this massive challenge that we have together so um what, what, what i mean what sorry what i make up from this is that just to be clear for the for the for the viewers is that with sdgs uh, people weren't necessarily able to put those into practice or make or make a, a headway um in delivering these come as a as a, a tool for people to actually relate differently come to different um, possibilities and 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 so they can be seen as a sort of okay if we want to move into that sustainability sdgs etc we've got a tool there to use would that be correct in that yeah yeah i would say the inner developers goals are more like say a social tool so mm. they're very useful in social settings uh at team meetings like you're you're away you just use them to really check in with each other where are we now what's going on inside of us together. And then it gives so much energy and I would say focus on what are we working on together? Uh, you know, the, the stuff you're working on as a team together. Um, so, and I would always say that it's a, it seems like it's an individual thing. Uh, it's inner development goals. And sometimes it's being misread as like the individual development goals, but it's definitely a collective initiative. Like we have to share this. Um, as soon as I ask you, What's one of these 23 that you really felt come alive this week? Boom, we have a different conversation and I can help you to bring that out even more and vice versa. So um, I would say just it's starting with that. It's starting with that spirit of, hey, this is helpful. Let's bring this into the social domain. Let's just use it. Let's go for it. I think we're slightly running over time, but I, I, I definitely must ask you this question. Art. What instills hope in you in all of this? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think we're just going back to what we already knew and already know. That, that gives me hope. Um, like 
as soon as you say hear someone say something that you feel is wise or spot on, it's most of the time in my consideration, it's something like, I knew this already. We feel yeah. right. We're in this together. We have to hold on to each other. We have to encourage each other. And when I see that happening around me, that gives me hope. Like, yeah, <laughs> we're here not for nothing. We're here for a reason. Let's let's make something out of it. Thank you very much, Art. Thank you. Thank you, Art and Ray. I'm sorry. I think I might have interrupted you for about a second there. Just at the moment, there was chaos going on with me, but um, apologies for that. I'm not sure whether it showed up on the screen or not. I'm, I'm really not sure. But uh, anyhow, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to have a brief chat with Michael now. Um, and Michael, we, we talked earlier about, um, just remind people who you are. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about um, uh, Daniel. Schmachtenberger. Schmachtenberger. We don't have the capacity for outsized influence over the current system. The current system will, will be what dominates. Um, and you talked a little bit about that. You, you, are you in a position to sort of expand a little bit about what that means? So just to remind people, if we don't have the capacity for outsized influence over the current mm -hmm. system, the current system will be what dominates. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> well, I bas basically it goes back to what I was alluding to a moment ago, which is that um, I'm going to have to use a bit of different language here because I, I'm wanting to resonate with um, Art's wonderful comments on inner development goals because it's what Schmachtenberger is pointing to is essentially an inner capacity, one both individual and collective. And um, but it's the capacity to be able, first of all, to see ourselves, to see the culture in which we come to think, come to feel, come to relate with one another. And it's literally like the water that we swim in. It is with us at every moment, including moments, you know, with our spouses, with our children, driving in the car, you know, in every moment we live in that culture. And in order to have, and that culture is really what constitutes what, what Schmachtenberger means by current systems. They are the current systems that have us. We don't have them. And to the degree that we can become aware of the inner mechanisms, again, both individual and collective, the inner mechanisms by which we are had by those current systems, to the degree we can see those, we can become much more um, uh, <clears throat> deliberate and choiceful in how we are going to understand the world and understand the complex situations and challenges that we have before us. And until we can do that, we're just simply going to be doing more of what we've already been doing. And we can't afford to do that anymore. And so Schmachtenberger's you know, phrase for me is a profound call to action. I mean, it literally woke me up uh, when I heard him say that. Okay, thank you. Um, now, you also talk about vertical facilitation. Hmm. What is that? And why is it of potential importance to ESG and sustainability more generally? So vertical facilitation is a somewhat fanciful term that I use. It points to the fact that it is it points to vertical development, which is development of our consciousness, to, to put it uh, briefly, uh, which is a development of that which the inner development goals points to. And um, so you could say that vertical facilitation is about helping people, again, become aware of the mechanisms by which they make sense of their world in order to become more choiceful. But it's also that suggests a kind of individual capacity, but it's also a human systems capacity, a collective capacity to be able to see the system. One of the things that we often say is revealing the system to itself. To the degree that we can see, reveal the system that determines us, again, we can become more choiceful. And vertical facilitation is a, is a kind of a methodology, a sort of human technology uh, for bringing that about. Why it's important, again, going back to 
uh, my reflections on the uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger quote, um, we can't afford to continue uh, business as usual. There, we need to upgrade the sense-making vehicle, the inner sense-making and meaning-making uh, by which we understand and then formulate action. Okay, thank you. And what differentiates this from other learning paradigms? Well, it um, it's really a couple of things. What I would say, first of all, is that it's non-conceptual and it's and it actually even goes beyond behavior. Most training paradigms are either kind of instructional, like uh, basically providing information, like you might be in a leadership course and be exposed to models of leadership, maybe models of adaptive leadership or models even of adult development and all that kind of thing, all of which really has no impact on the way people operate in the world. And similarly, even behavioral sort of interventions where we teach people certain skills, the issue or the problem with that is that people may learn those skills, but they haven't developed the inner capacity to discern when and how those skills ought to be exercised in any given moment. So there's a lack of discernment and finesse and subtlety. So what vertical facilitation does is it sidesteps all of that by generating what we call heat experiences for people. These are experiences in which people have a kind of disorienting dilemma. A dis, it's, it's disorienting in the sense that it stands a known category by which people make sense of something, usually in relation to a situation that someone or a group of people really care about. So it's like dislodging that known category and leaving people in that sort of uh, in-between space where it becomes possible to formulate a different way of understanding, making sense of that. And when and vertical facilitation is in part about creating environments in which those heat experiences are repeated. And it all relates to neuroscience and to um, uh, um, memory reconsolidation in the area of, of psychology, which is about supplanting old memory um, connections with new ones. And vertical facilitation involves a number of environmental uh, um, qualities to make that happen. Okay, thank you for that, Michael. So, so what does this mean for for organisations in the context of leadership? Well, um, for me, that's sort of a that's almost the most important question because um, we. Um, uh, teach coaches and consultants and leaders and managers uh, the art of vertical facilitation. When we take that into the organization, it's really about um, helping people develop the capacity, again, for outsized influence over the current systems. And when we start to look at that, we begin to see leadership, organizational leadership, not so much as inventing strategies and coming up with systems and structures uh, uh, by which things are gonna get done. But the new role, the new job of leadership is to grow other leaders, to grow the inner capacity of the people within their organizations and to leverage technologies that are drawn from uh, adult development, from transformative learning, from uh, relationship systems coaching, even from what we call uh, ontological inquiry. All of these are sciences from which management and leadership can draw in order to create and design environments uh, for, deliberately, uh, for deliberate development in our organizations. Okay, thank you. And, um, and what about the leadership journey? Can you take us on that journey? What would that be like? So there are, um, so one, one of the journeys that we um, take people on is called the vertical facilitator. And it's a, both an inner development journey in which we create, again, these sorts of heat experiences. And there are a number of other elements that go into this as well. So that people begin to confront how they relate to getting other people to do things. And for the most part, consultants and managers and leaders and coaches 
are ultimately in the business of trying to get other people to do things. And one of the things that happens in the vertical facilitator is people realize the utter futility of that. So the vertical facilitator is a leadership journey in which people, um, in a sense, become acquainted with the inner drives that are ultimately not very useful in terms of how they work with people. And it also introduces practices and skills that people can develop in order to uh, help grow a kind of similar awakening in other people around them. So it's both an inner development journey, but it's also a journey of, of training in, in, in skillful practice in the area of working with other people uh, in, in a similar way. Okay, thank you. So you've now got your uh, bit of a plug opportunity for you. How, how do people get involved? Um, um, probably, the best, <laughs> probably the easiest way is for people to simply go to theverticalfacilitator.com and there are materials there that they can find. You can also go to sense and respond leadership.com uh, uh, where you can also find materials. But the verticalfacilitator.com includes um, uh, a learning journey, part of which is free, and uh, there's lots of materials and uh, for people to, um, to learn more about this. Okay, thank you very much. And those addresses again the verticalfacilitator.com. Uh, and the sense and respond leadership.com. Um, I don't know whether maybe you could put those two URLs in the comment at some point. Um, okay, sure. That'd be great. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, well, guess what? We are, we could have finished three minutes ago, but um, I thought we could have a, a, a brief chat. Um, Dawn has said that what do you think about technology that actually deliberately attempts to hide the system, to hijack our ability to discern what's going on, uh, what's going on? Any thoughts about that? <laughs> the, the technology that I find is the most dangerous is the technology of which we are unaware. And um, so it's my feeling that again, to the degree that we can continue to develop more awareness of the systems that determine how we think and operate, um, we're going to actually become more facile at, at sensing these sorts of systems that you're uh, referring to, Don. That would be my take on that. Okay, thank you. Well, I've got a few questions, but I'm going to be a little bit mean, and I'm going to ask you some really quick responses. So, <laughs> um, uh, resource allocation. Um, prioritizing investments in social initiatives can be challenging, especially in times of financial constraint. We're during a meta crisis when organizations are navigating multiple challenges simultaneously. Um, so, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, resource allocation. Anyone want to? Um, anyone got some wisdom to say about that? And just um, very, very. I'd like to. I think this is I think this is a rehash of the old slicing the pie story. So it's a fallacy that you have to slice the pie you've currently got and hand out little pieces. What we should be aiming for is actually making a bigger pie of, of as I said, bringing people to purpose and being innovative and creative. Currently, I will say to you that most large organizations are wasting approximately 50% of their budget on failed deployment of strategy. And most of that is due to the lack of information flow in organizations. If you invest in social, bring people back to purpose, get better communication going and better collaboration, the money's all there because it's being wasted at present. Okay, thank you for that. Um, cultural sensitivity and localization. So if you've got a multinational organization, um, there are different sort of cultural ways of looking at things. The, 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 um, there the are different approaches, or if you've got an, an environment in which there's a lot of hybrid working going on, um, how can you engage people, um, taking into a, taking that into account? Um, anyone? Art? Have you got? You seem to be smiling. Have you got any thoughts yeah. about that? Yeah, I would say my simple answer would be ask each other a lot. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Be able to pay for that. So pay for people to, people's time that the relevant questions are being asked. And with relevant, I mean just how you're doing, what's engaging you at the moment, what's disengaging you at the moment. That's where the magic happens because we could. And that's very simple. It sounds almost too simple, but I, I see it goes r- going wrong there when we start to install two complicated things there. <laughs> Bring humans together, help them to ask the relevant questions towards each other, and then we'll fly out of that room feeling heard, supported, backed up, ready for some more, or ready to leave. <laughs> Both is fine. Yeah. Mike, Michael, I see this playing out now in the workspace. This is the whole hybrid question. Because organizations are desperate to get people back in the office and 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 leadership are very fearful of people self-organizing and creating hybrid spaces so they're trying to we see it every day in the press they're trying to make people do things but as art says far better to come around the other way show real leadership and start to get the conversations going and getting people creating what works for them those are the systems we want and spaces we want to be creating Okay, thank you for that. Um, what about integrating social goals within business strategy? Uh, how does that work? Any uh, a very quick answer? Anyone? Anyone want to have a, a quick answer? Go at answering that question. Yeah, make it part of your strategy. That would be my quick question. And, and how that should be a co-creative space, I would say. But. Even raising that question, is it part of a strategy? Is it helping or leaving, are we leaving it out on purpose? Um, that can already create to shift the needle. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up very, very shortly. Um, achieving long term commitment. Um, I mean, this is not, this, these are not five minute programs that we're talking about today. This is a long term. How, how do we achieve that? I think that um, one of the one of the key pressures in the existing system is this short termism, mm-hmm. um, and and it, it gets shorter and shorter, and the feedback cycles are shorter and shorter. What what um, organisations will want to invest in ultimately is is um, the intelligence, the skills, the creativeness of organisations and their relationship with customers. This isn't a short term thing. This is about investing in people, innovating, etc. And we used to do this. You know, I'm looking at yellow stickies on my desk from 3M who used to give people a day a week. They invested long term in innovation. So we need to get back to that. And that's, you know, that's part of people um, really changing the systems that they're in. You know, Robert Keegan, just to build off that, uh, he has this notion of organizations as a curriculum that organizations need to shift from a focus on producing, producing, to a focus on, yes, producing the goods, but also producing the, the, the qualities of mindful engagement and intelligence and you know, uh, consciousness capable of being able to produce. And companies that actually uh, take that mandate on, those are the companies that tend to be the most high performing. Um, people can check this out in Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy's book, Everyone Culture. Uh, so that's Robert Keegan. What's culture? Uh, everywhere culture. Everywhere. Robert Keegan, Keegan everywhere culture. Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to have to co- draw to a close in a moment now. What I thought I might do is give you all 30 seconds. So um, if you want to summarize all of this in 30 seconds, you're in an elevator with someone and you've got to and you're and you're only going to the third floor, and you've got to talk quick to explain why this is so important. Um, can you have a go at that? Any particular order? I'm happy to start. Go on, then, Ray. Well, I mean, I've talked about moving to a different story and creating space for people. I'd just like to make a point from the Gallup 2023 State of the Global Workplace. It says, "Change the way people are managed." In this year's report, we estimate that low engagement costs the global economy $8.8 trillion. That's 9% of global GDP. If we solve this problem, it will mean the difference between success and failure for humanity. Okay, Michael. Um, I would say that putting the S in ESG 
consider that S is all ultimately the foundation, that growing human capability is the most important work for us to do right now. I know I've been beating that drum. I'm sorry. It's a drum that needs to be beaten. Okay. Thank you, Michael. And R, ah, it looks like you've the last words are going to be with you. Yeah, what a pressure, eh? I was just thinking, like, well, how I'm going to summarize all this. I mean, I've been listening just as you to the wisdom shared and the ideas and new books to read and dive into. So I'm also blown away with that. So I'll just stick with my old, the old one, like meet people where they are in a sense and make sure you connect with them right there. And um, let, let, yeah, to keep our curiosity, to ask questions around their engagement and where they want to go. And I think we can be a light for everyone around us. So um, at least it's hard for today. Uh, I feel inspired and backed up and to go back at it. So Good. Thanks. We're glad to hear that. Well, thank you all very much, everybody. Uh, we're on again next week. We're an hour late to next week, but you'll you'll be finding out. Where I'll be putting all the details about that show up shortly. Thank you very much, uh, Ray, Michael, and Art. And um, and uh, goodbye. Thanks, Michael.